The goal of Data Transformers podcast is to accelerate digital transformation by bridging the gap between business outcomes and rapidly advancing technologies. And we aim to bridge this gap by focusing on data. I am Peggy Sai, top 50 women in tech influencer, co-author of the AI book, and data governance expert. I'm Ramesh Danta, an entrepreneur, a tech blogger, and AI enthusiast. So now we'll go to the second phase of the discussion. So Patrick, it's about your professional journey, okay? And uh, so any cursory profile, I mean, uh, just a review of your, your profile on LinkedIn. Well, so there is a researcher, PhD, and I joined <laughs> Los Alamos Laboratory and then uh, NASA, maybe rocket scientist, maybe. And then you transitioned to the corporate world. You were a CEO of a company. Now you're one of the largest semiconductor companies, Samsung. So if you could just walk us through what was the journey like? Yeah, so I, I started out as a kid interested in how the world works. Uh, so when I came to university, I naturally signed up for a theoretical physics degree. Um, and I didn't have any money. So I had to work in the summertime. And um, I, by, by luck, basically got a chance to join Los Alamos National Lab. Sorry, actually, if I can interject, you, you, were, you said you were German at the beginning. Yes. Uh, but you studied in UK. It looks like what happened there? Uh, just uh... Uh, so I, I I'm German. Um, my parents are German, and I have a German citizenship. Um, I actually grew up in Asia, uh, mm. in Malaysia, in the Philippines. Uh, so when I graduated high school in the Philippines, I decided to go to the United Kingdom to to London to take my university studies. Got it. Uh, I couldn't afford the United States. It's too expensive to go to college here. <laughs> really? Uh, you work here. <laughs> so do you speak Tagalog? I'm just curious. I, I don't, you know, it's terrible. I never learned the local language. Uh, I went to international school. Um, so I learned English. Hmm. Cool. Sorry, uh, I, inter I, I um, yeah, intercepted. So then you were at Los Alamos. Yeah, so let's uh, take it from there. Yeah. So um, I spent two summers uh, at Los Alamos and the summer after that at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory at, at NASA. Uh, basically doing internships and and earning uh, earning uh, the money that I needed to live for the rest of the year. Um, and at the end of my my master's, I decided that I wanted to continue in this in this realm. But research um, uh, is done in the mathematics department if you want to do theoretical physics type applications. So I transitioned to the mathematics department and then uh, spent some time doing research. And the applications were then to do with uh, using artificial intelligence to do some of these uh, tasks. So that's when I started getting into the field. Mm -hmm. And um, at university, at least in the physics and math departments, they kind of suggest to you on a daily basis that the thing to do with your life is to become a research professor. Um, and so uh, I, of course, bought the program. And uh, so after I finished my PhD, I went to Germany and, and became a, a, a research professor for three years for applied math in, in Bremen, the north of Germany. Mm -hmm. At which point I figured out um, that really you can't apply applied mathematics while being at the university. <laughs> uh, you need to be a commercial entity so that you can actually, you know, you can hire people and, you know, write offers and things like that. So I started my own company mm -hmm. at that time together with other people. Um, and we took artificial intelligence to the infrastructure uh, universe. So the oil and gas companies, chemical companies. And um, we primarily did predictive maintenance, uh, which is to say we forecasted when pieces of equipment like pumps and compressors and gas turbines and things like that would fail. Uh, and so I did that for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, I came to the United States uh, four years ago, and I live in California in the Bay Area. And um, then I transitioned to Samsung SDS, um, who were looking for somebody to head up their AI division. Wow. I was really struck as well, but some of the things you wrote on your LinkedIn posts and articles is the, the practicality of AI and making sure there's a, a real business use case. Um, and I think you mentioned that and in, in the company you formed, 
um, how you applied AI. I mean, was that something you deliberately wanted to make sure you focused on um, in, in your company? Well, the business case is always absolutely crucial. Um, a, a lot of AI that you see out there is made at universities um, because the AI is challenging or the use case seems interesting or cool, but it's not always immediately obvious, or in many cases, it's not obvious whether that is commercially relevant, mm. yeah, whether the AI technology is going, is going to either save costs or generate revenue or and somehow be, uh, be commercially viable. But if you're trying to do AI to earn a living, um, that very much becomes the centerpiece. Um, and so if, like, like me, I, was, I had an AI startup, mm -hmm. um, I had payroll uh, to pay, you know, and so, of course, you have to go to customers and convince them that your piece of AI isn't just cool and fancy, but will actually, uh, you know, produce something on the bottom line and, and justify its own cost. Uh, so I very much encourage um, everyone, including university researchers or students, uh, to look into doing AI for a purpose that has relevancy in the real world, right? It either saves costs somewhere, it contributes to the revenue somewhere, or it automates something that previously had to be done by manual labor. Uh, something along these lines um, is, is hugely beneficial. And I think it's also very important to be able to communicate that. Hmm. So actually along those lines, Patrick, now you're you know, vice president of artificial intelligence at Samsung. So you're building the organization. You're building the literacy about AI in the organizations, right? So making sure that people know, and then probably you're also bringing you know, the, the data culture you're trying to inculcate in the organization. So taking all that in aspect, as you're building, growing the organization, what kinds of uh, skill set, knowledge are you looking for people that you're planning to bring on board, whether externally or you're trying to bring internally, recruiting, hiring people? What, what kinds of things they should have, in your opinion? Well, um, if, uh, if it's your career goal to be a data scientist, uh, mm -hmm. for example, which is the sort of people that, that we would hire in, in the department, um, there are skill sets that I would call table stakes. Um, you know, those are the skill sets you, you have to have, but that don't make you stand out yet. And skills like that would be, um, you need to have some knowledge and experience of programming. Um, for example, in Python, um, you might want to have some experience in the popular AI frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, and this kind of a thing. Um, you'd need to know a little bit about how to pre-process and prepare data sets. Um, you know, you, you would want to know about the usual data analysis uh, sorts of things like statistical testing and probability analysis and things of that sort. So some mathematical and statistical knowledge as well as with some wrangling of computer technologies. But beyond that level come skill sets that are uh, less common, but, but more valuable, I think. And one of them is communication. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I know it's, it's kind of a, a trite thing to say, yeah. but it's actually really important because if you're a brilliant mathematician, but you can't talk to the domain expert, um, then I don't, I don't care how good you are at data analysis. You're never even going to get the data to analyze. Um, so, and at the other end of the game plan, um, the, the customer, whether this customer is an internal or an external customer, he wants his result delivered mm -hmm. in a language that they can understand yeah. in, a, in, a, in either a business language or an application language. So again, there is an aspect of translation involved, you know, not from Spanish to English, but it's a translation from domain English to human English. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, somebody needs to, needs to do that. So um, I find that actually a lot of what I do is talk and translate um, from this world to that world. Um, and it, it needs often um, the, the learning of concepts and vocabulary that are specific to whatever issue, right? If you're trying to solve a medical problem, mm -hmm. you need to learn a little bit of medicine. Mm -hmm. yeah? 
yes, I'm a data scientist. I will stick within my, my realm, but I do need to learn your vocabulary to be able to talk to you as a doctor, right? If I'm talking uh, with autonomous driving, then I need to talk the language of car engineering, right? Again, that's not me, but I need to have a modicum of vocabulary to be able to engage in a conversation with you. Um, so it's those kinds of communication skills, verbal and written, um, that I think make, make a big, big difference. And then, of course, the business case, right? Everybody needs to speak a little bit of the language of the dollar mm -hmm. um, to be able to say um, in, in nice, concise words, how much will this project benefit the organization? That is, that is very important. And those two aspects, communication in general and business case thinking, those are the, the skill sets that will that'll not just get you into a data scientist role, but that, that'll get you promoted later on. Makes sense to me. I mean, that's, that's uh, pretty comprehensive. And I've, I've also worked in the past with many data scientists. And I, I also see that, as you said, the gap is um, translating to the business and speaking in their terms and not just being stuck in the data science vernacular and um, it's, do you th which part is the harder harder thing to learn? Is it the the, the programming in Python, or is it actual speaking and in business talk that you think is more challenging to most people? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I would say that you know all the mathematical learnings and the programming um, is something that people who have an interest in data scientists. They, they kind of naturally learn that um, they learn that relatively early on because they typically do that as, a, as an undergraduate student. Um, and so they, they have that, right? This, this is where, where they're at. And people who are at that point, um, they typically have a hard time with communication. Um, and out of the communication with other experts versus the communication with the business folks, it's typically the conversation with the business folks that's the hardest obstacle mm. to overcome. Because at that point, you have to leave all the science and all the mathematics at the door and uh, all the details and come in with just the 30,000 foot overview and the final answer. And nobody cares how you got to the final answer. They only care about the bottom line. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that, that's often hard um, for detail-oriented people to put up with. So Patrick, this is, as we come towards the final uh, phase of the, the, the podcast interview, so I will ask in a little bit of flippant way, um, you're the vice president of artificial intelligence, doesn't mean that you, have, you stop learning. Right, even a VP of a, you know AI of Samsung SDS, Patrick has to constantly keep, keep learning. So where does Dr. Bangard go to learn and then keep enhancing the knowledge? And then what's your advice based on your experience? What people should should be learning and where they should be learning from? Oh, I'm I'm learning every single day. Yeah. Um, I, I probably learn every hour uh, of of the business day, um, and from many sources. Um, Definitely, I learn a great deal from the people in my own department, mm -hmm. um, right? Uh, they come up with new ideas. Uh, they find new pieces of information that, that they bring. Um, I learn a lot from my management who ask uh, good questions that need answering. Not always is the answer obvious. Um, I learn from our partner and, and customer companies who ask us to do certain things that we never thought of. Um, I dream up questions of my own and don't know the answer. And then that needs to be investigated like the COVID problem, right? I, I thought, Hey, can, can we do this based on x-rays? Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting question. It took us three months to answer it. Turns out the answer is yes, but that, that was not clear uh, in the beginning. Yeah. Um, so definitely um, I learn a lot and um, I, I encourage everybody else in the organization to keep, keep on learning. And we have to. AI Are there is any specific quickly... sources that you can mention that you really think are very insightful that people should go to and then say, hey, the websites or, you know, some influencers or, you know, that 
uh, that you can mention? Uh, so for me, the source of most information is LinkedIn. Okay. Um, I think it's it's fantastic. Um, you know, virtually every piece of relevant AI news is uh, is posted by somebody. Mm -hmm. So if you if you are on LinkedIn, uh, you can just either follow or connect to a number of the uh, influencers in the, in that space, and their posts will inform you of uh, more AI news than you can read. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a personal fan of LinkedIn and Twitter as well for, for a lot of these news. Um, Patrick, I love in the beginning of the podcast, he talked about COVID, um, you know, as a, a, a situation, right, that prompted you to work on, embark on this AI project. I'm just curious about what other things have sparked your interest, like what future um, projects, innovative things are, are you thinking about or planning about that you love to, to work on? Well, right now we're really pushing what's called auto ML. Um, so this is the idea that um, a number of tasks in machine learning or artificial intelligence need to currently be done by people, like deciding which model, which parameters to put for the learning algorithms and so on. And these are really decisions that are hard to make because we don't really know how to make them. In other words, the way we make them is trial and error. Mm. Um, and that is uh, not intelligent, right? Uh, trial and error is not an intelligent way of doing things. It, it is a laborious way of doing things. And so uh, we're trying to make that a little bit less stupid by automating it with artificial intelligence. So this mm. is an artificial intelligence that trains an artificial intelligence to do a task. Um, so auto ML is like this. It's like artificial intelligence squared, if you like. Is it the operationalizing of the AI? Is that what you're talking about? Is it, are we talking about different something? Uh, yeah, we're kind of talking about bootstrapping the AI process. Hmm. Yeah. So um, is DevOps involved in this one? AI DevOps? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's definitely something we're pushing. Um, and the other thing we're pushing is called distributed training, um, which is to say, typically you would train uh, your task on a single computer um, and it takes a certain amount of time. You know, Oftentimes, especially image processing, video processing takes a very long time. Uh, you might need weeks to train your model once. Um, but if you use several computers simultaneously, you can cut that training time down. So that's one of our big focus areas uh, to make sure that we can do that. In fact, we, we succeeded in doing that so we can scale a training task linearly across many computers. So uh, you can rent them, of course, in the cloud. So getting computers is not the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to one of the hyperscalers, you can rent however many computers you need. And um, by that usual high school problem, right? If it takes one computer 100 hours to perform the task, how many computers do you need to do it in one hour? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out the answer is not 100 computers. It turns out the answer is about 70. Mm -hmm. So you think like, why is that, right? It's a very intriguing question. Yeah. You have a task that requires 100 hours of effort you would expect if you use 100 computers, it would now take one hour of effort, but no, it takes less than that. Uh, it takes less than that because of various arguments. It comes down to the available video memory on each one of the computers. But the point is that by doing work in a distributed fashion like this, you actually save the amount of computational hours. In other words, you save dollars in training time mm and you get the answer a lot faster. Yeah, so it's it's beneficial all around. It's faster and cheaper. Correct, correct. Um, so Patrick, uh, as we come to the end of the podcast, are there any topics, any things that we did not cover, something that you want to uh, you know, talk about in, in, con in conclusion? I think we covered a lot. Um, so in conclusion, I just wanna say that um, artificial intelligence is a big hype topic right now. Mm -hmm. 
um, like many other hype topics have been around in, in the past. And I, I know people shot themselves in their feet by saying, oh, this fantastic thing is just going to uh, rule the world. And then yeah. the thing disappeared. Um, I think AI is not like that. Um, I think AI is here to stay. Um, in fact, it already rules large parts of our life, um, right? We watch what Netflix tells us to watch. We go where Google tells us to go. And that's the reality, whether we like it or not. Um, so AI is here. AI is here to stay. Um, so, you know, if you think of this um, as a possible career path, that's, that's good, good for you as an individual, out there. Um, if you are a, a business person, business leader, um, you will need to think of ways to apply AI to your business. Um, it will have an application to your business, I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you still have some time to incorporate it before your competition um, will um, have a large benefit from taking it over themselves. So it's one of those things where um, I think the time is right to uh, to have to participate. Great. Thank, thanks so much, um, Patrick, uh, for really sharing uh, the practicalities of AI and really explaining us in such detail of, of all the aspects. So I really appreciate and I learned so much today. Yeah, I know. It was pretty educational, informative. Um, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much for having me on the show, Ramesh and Peggy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you liked what you heard today and would like to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite player like iTunes and Spotify. And please do rate our podcast. Also, please go to our website, www.datatransformerspodcast.com for more episodes, blogs, and information on our speakers. Thank you.